it was a good few years after that before I became aware of like other conversations of Tommy's and so on and so forth. Well, there, there were there were a few tunes like that, and I suppose they were called Tommy Peoples as well, just purely because somebody heard them play them or had or hadn't heard anybody else play them. Um, so there was quite a bit of that. Um, but in the in the general run of things, there there. I didn't hear a lot of Tommy's compositions played. Well, I suppose he didn't put them out there a lot. Uh, and I suppose it was only when we got as far as the Quiet Glen album that uh, I suppose Tommy was more comfortable letting them out there. Uh, I, I don't know why. Uh, some of them would have been composed a long time. Even Grania's Jig, I believe that was composed in the 1960s. Yeah, it was really nice to see the tune in the book and... Uh a picture of Tommy and, and my mum in the, in the book as well. Um, when Tommy came back, I, I suppose he, was, he might have been up in the house a couple of times, and then there, was se there were sessions in St. Johnson, and they used to meet up uh, quite frequently at, the, at that stage. So, and then he, his mum used to tell stories about the, the session and, and <laughs> some, some of the funniest things that happened in the session in the Central Hotel. The one that he mentioned is that the... the one of the fiddlers who probably didn't have very many tunes, but it didn't matter where Mrs. Kelly left the potted plant. He always seemed to sit underneath it, and he didn't have many tunes, but he had a great warm. And it wasn't long before there were flowers and leaves flying everywhere, you know. <laughs> so uh, he remembers stories like that. Uh, so he wrote this uh, tune from for a moment called the Kelly McGinley's, and actually I recorded it, and I just was looking back over the notes there, and I realised. <laughs> I missed, <laughs> missed a couple of flattened C's there, so must have been in the course of playing it, uh, they gradually disappeared. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, jig there, so it's a really nice one. Actually, I found it hard to learn that one off the off the notes. I think it's because uh, most of the tunes I'm learning are out of the, off the music now. But um, I suppose one of the sobering aspects is when you learn one of Tommy's tunes, uh, which I did off the notes, because he he signed a copy of the the tune about uh, his great aunt uh, Julia Devine, who's also my great aunt. And he signed it for mum, and I learned it off the, it's framed, so we, I learned it off that. <laughs> Unfortunately, the last uh, night there, as I actually as I was preparing to come here, I uh, heard him playing it on this, uh, this album, recorded at Fiddler's Hearth. <laughs> so after you've heard yourself playing it, and then you hear Tommy playing it, <laughs> you realise that you know, you're probably a bit of, bit of a way to go. But I, I think um, in terms of the, of the written music, and like, uh, Toner Quinn, who's in the Journal of Music, he, he talked about the gulf that exists between the music on the page and then what Tommy Peoples brings to it. So he, it's, not, it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was uh, the, the Julia Devine. I wonder if I can I remember now.
So that's Julia Devine, and uh, I didn't know her, but she was my mum's aunt, and she was also Tommy's uh, great aunt. So it's really nice to tune for her as well. Yeah, this is uh, that's interesting because it talks about Kenny Kylie Hall. This was a an important one for Tommy because if you see this. Uh, court, civil bill ejectment on the title. It was a sort of dispute about Kenny Kelly Hall. And uh, I think it's important for, uh, for Tommy because Kenny Kelly Hall was a place for the local uh, community, local Catholic community to get together. And I think Tommy actually organized stuff in it as well. And um, this was an attempt not, not to have it go ahead as that, that, uh, as that sort of function. Uh, but I'll read it out. Uh, Julia Devine was my great aunt, uh, wife of Tommy Devine, my grandfather's brother on my father's side. I used to cycle to the neighbouring town, Rafo, that's my hometown, to get my mother's insulin when I was 12 or 13. Halfway there lived Julia, so I would always call when coming home. She was a big age. On one of these visits, she reached for a tin over the mantelpiece, gave me a paper and instructed me to take it and keep it. It turned out to be a summons for my grandfather and her husband, brothers-in-law, to attend court. The date was 1917. The reason? They had purchased an old derelict cottage in Kinyakali, intending to build a community hall for the Catholic population. Because the intended use differed from what the seller had believed, he brought them to court to try to nullify the sale. Kinyakali Hall ended up being built, though, and it was a lively part of the community until the end of the 1950s. It was not a very imposing structure with a tin roof, but it was very effectively used for music lessons, dance classes, meetings and dances. It was also home to a fife and drum band, Patrick Sarsfields, that's the one I was talking about, that Bob Peoples used to write the tunes for, and the parts. I remember my uncle Matha, who played the fiddle, telling me that the music for the dances were, was provided by pairs of fiddle players. Each pair played for so long and then another pair took over. The pay was two pence a night. There were plenty of local players in that generation. Some of the dances were all night affairs. Hall still exists, but it's seen better days. It's never in use anymore. And as you can see, there's a picture of the Patrick Sarsfields Fife and Drum Band. And there's Kinji Kali Hall. I was there last week and took a picture of it. And uh, it's kind of like this. It's very overgrown. It's hard to imagine it as a social centre. But from what Tommy was saying, it was a very important place for the local community at that time. And his relatives were very involved in getting it all organised. So it's really nice that's associated with this tune, uh, Julia Devines. Um, I might play a set of jigs here that um, these two jigs I learned from Siobhan while oh. I was down during the course in America. And um, the first one is a tune called Julia Devines, and the second one is The Stepping Stones. And the first one's four part jig. And this one I found interesting in that I found it hard at the beginning because I, it felt like there were two different tunes. It was only after playing it over and over and over and over again that I could feel the connection between like the first two parts and then the next two parts. And then the second tune is Stepping Stone. I think this tune he mentioned that um, he called it this because he used to, whenever he was going to Joe Cassidy, his cousin, to learn music, they used to have to cross over a few stepping stones over the river to go to his house. So.
before Tommy died, there was tribute to him down at the Willie Clancy yep. Summer School, and um, he introduced a lot of that. And uh, one of the the sets of tunes you played on the day, I remember, was the uh, Fat Cat and the was it the Mouse in the Attic? And mm. Why did you Why did you pick them, those? Because I thought there was a huge sense of mischief in it as a piece of music. I just thought this is mischievous and. That's the thing I'm saying about it. Like, you know, to, to get that sort of an emotion, that is a very, very rare thing. It's, the tunes were totally, they're, they're not the normal construction, but they're traditional. And then the way he played them as well, like, you know, it adds to the, to the mischief that was in it. And I really, really kind of thought, well, this kind of, and I was playing it for an audience. I just wanted this as an illustration of, look, this is what this guy is about. And there is this thing in it. And you make up your own mind. That's just my feeling about it, that it's mischievous. Other people might have a different view. Uh, so that's why I did it. But the mouse in the attic and the fat cat, um, uh, you know, I couldn't listen to those two tunes without laughing at them, you know. Uh, and I can see this mouse, you know, we're running about all over the place. And uh, um, there's a, many of mouse in the attic, and I know exactly what, what all that's about. <laughs> And the fat cat, where he plays the, the, this note, it's, it's, neither, it's neither A nor A flat nor G sharp. It's, it's somewhere in between. And it's sort of in, 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 in nowhere land. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's a note that I suppose doesn't exist, but it's there. Uh, there's something about that. And uh, nobody else would get away with it. Uh, you, you, you could never play that in any other tune. Uh, and it sounds right, except except here, and the Kinney Kelly Klansmen, that's, uh, and Black Pats, real. Well, I tend to play Black Pats and the Kinney Kelly Klansmen along with them. Uh, to my mind, the two of those go together. Uh, but the, the, the Kinney Kelly Klansmen, there's, uh, that reel is in a class of its own. It re really is a, a work of art. Well, I suppose as I say, you can say that about any of Tommy's tunes. Cassidy's reel mm. because he had a, it seemed like he had a great fondness for his cousin that that's that man and that he named the tune after and um, I mean Tommy's tunes are for me a challenge to learn and then they're another challenge again then to play so I'll try I'll give this one a go anyway and see how it works out Lovely. Yeah. that's your own story <laughs> Thank you. 
it's so intricate in places and I mean there's a lot of I mean a lot of the tunes he writes there's a lot of skipping over and back between the first string and the bottom string Go to the bottom one yeah. yeah yeah I mean even that bit <laughs> I mean, I find that really hard to play in a tidy fashion. So, uh, yeah, that's just an example of some of the, the weird stuff that was going on in his head. But I mean, when Tommy played some of those tunes, they just sounded so melodic and it was just it was like second nature to him, you know. But no matter what stage you went into the house, there was always there was always evidence, even if he was only just sitting there, there was always evidence of something going on workways, be it maybe half or three quarters of a tune scribbled out beside him or he was writing bits and pieces and you'd hear Orna G was on in the background you know because he had a really he had a love for the Irish language too and yeah so he was composing all the time exactly and even in the la in the later stages when he wasn't physically fit to play the fiddle the fiddle would be sitting there and he'd just say he'd sometimes just lift it and you know do this to try and get the tune or whatever finished and um, yeah there's always um, there was always a piece there or he'd be going back to another piece maybe that he had written further back because he always I was saying I don't know if he has any tunes that are less than two parts especially jigs and reels he's a man of a lot of parts and I said is there any particular reason for that and he said he always felt that his two part jigs or reels were never they never sounded like they were finished so even if he had one that had maybe two or three parts from earlier on, he maybe would have been working on them to try and finish them off that if they needed another part or two. So yeah, he was always at something. And he had written quite a few tunes that I noticed that needed third position work. I have no <laughs> background in formal music and I thought, well, it's a pity to miss out on this. So I tried to work on that for a while so that I could maybe, now sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but, um, it's a shame not to play those tunes mm. that he has written and obviously Tommy had a grow for, you know, experimenting further up on the fiddle, you know, and again that was something that wasn't really the norm to what I was listening to at home either. Very rarely did you hear, unless some came into the session that had a classical background and they were playing airs or something, but not in trad music, it was unheard of to hear anybody playing really in third position. Mm -hmm. Different things inspired him, you know, to write. It might have been something like, it might have been people. It might have been um, people in his family. Uh, it might have been just something simple like being out for a walk with someone and maybe something someone said or, I mean, I think that there's a sliptic that he wrote called Heels Over Her Head. And that's one, one time when he was with the character Cattle McConnell. Where I think, were they in Milltown or somewhere? I can't remember exactly where they were anyway, but yeah, I think maybe tripped a bit on. So, um, and he, Tommy describes the way he <laughs> tripped with heels over her head, as opposed to <laughs> heads over heels. <laughs> that wee mazurka that he wrote. I'll see, I'll see if I can find, or I think of another reel maybe afterwards.
Too. That's one of his, yeah. yeah. Any name on that? I think that's the one that's that he wrote for, or named after his grandfather, Jimmy oh, Peoples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 